I think there's two types of hoarding that are interesting in today's day and age. First, the physical hoarding, but also the digital hoarding we have, right? Think about how many photos we have or files we might have stored on Dropbox. We're worried we're going to need them someday, so we keep them around. And so the storage we need to have gets larger and larger, even though it's not physical storage. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. Well, there are many things that we buy or we acquire that we love and hold on to for a long time, even maybe after their usefulness has passed. But then there are also instances where people will acquire something and they don't really use it. Yet, for some reason, they still hang on to it. So we wanted to find out why that is the case. Jonah Berger, marketing professor at the Wharton School, has done research into this, and he joins us right now to talk about it. Jonah, interesting topic that, that you've looked into. What was it that kind of piqued your interest in the first place? You know, I think we've all had this personal experience where we have something lying around our house that we don't use. And in, in some cases, it makes a lot of sense. Maybe it's uh, something someone gave us that we wish we had a use for, but we don't, right? Um, uh, you know, we thought we would play guitar. Someone nicely gave us a guitar and we don't end up using it. Or maybe it's a family heirloom, right? Maybe it's our grandmother's china that we personally don't love, but we don't have as fancy occasions or it reminds us of her, so we keep around. And those things make a sense. But there's a, a third class of things that makes a little bit less sense. Maybe it's a, a bottle of wine that wasn't that special to begin with. Maybe it's um, uh, an item that we got that wasn't that important to us at the beginning, but somehow we end up holding on to it and, and never using it. The, the wine wasn't that special at the beginning, but now it feels really special and we don't drink it. Or the, the shirt, we were saving it for that special occasion and it never really arose and now we never end up wearing it. And so we wondered why might that be and could we understand uh, consumer behavior more broadly by understanding this particular situation? So take us through how you actually did that because I, I'd find that interesting, just how you go about that process. Yeah, you know, I think there's often uh, products uh, that we buy that aren't that special to start with. Maybe it's a, a bottle of wine. It's a kind of normal bottle uh, of wine, or maybe it's a, a shirt or a dress that's maybe a little nicer than what we would normally buy, but not that that nice. Um, and these things start off as rather normal, right? Rather sort of normal, ordinary possessions. But if an occasion comes around where we don't end up using it, maybe because we felt it wasn't a perfectly good fit, or maybe we just wanted to save it for something else, What's interesting is now that thing that didn't start so special becomes a little bit more special. We go, well, hold on. If I didn't use it for that last occasion, maybe it's worth saving for something a little bit better. And so the next time comes around, right? We have an opportunity to use it, but then we might be likely to save it again. And suddenly we go through this specialness spiral where something that started rather ordinary becomes a little bit more extraordinary. We end up saving it for special occasions and not using it in ordinary ones. And something that wasn't that special to begin with becomes a lot more special than we intended. So this isn't just a, kind of a normal emotional attachment to something, is it? You know, certain things we start with an emotional attachment towards, right? So our, our grandmother's china might be something where we have a strong emotional attachment at the beginning, and, and that doesn't change. What I think is neat here is how the items change through our process of non-consumption, right? It didn't start out that special, yet by not using it and not using it and not using it, and, and not just ignoring it, but almost consciously not using it, right? Deciding, is this the right occasion to wear that new pair of shoes? Maybe I'll hold off, right? I'll tell a personal story. Many years ago, I was on the academic job market. Uh, and I got a suit, right, for a, a big job interview, as I, uh, as many people do when they're on the job market. And I thought the suit was really special, and I loved it, and I wore it for the academic job market. But then I didn't wear it soon after because I wanted to save it for something. And then months went by, and months went by, and years went by, and I was saving and saving it. And eventually, this thing went out of style, right? And it wasn't because it was super special to begin with or super meaningful to begin with. It was more that I didn't use it and it became more special and eventually became so old that I didn't want to use it anymore. And so I think a lot of times we end up with things around our home that didn't have meaning at the beginning, but get it through this process of non-consumption. How much then is, does this to a degree explain maybe some of the elements of hoarding that we see out there? 
I think it's certainly the case. And, um, you know, it, it's very interesting uh, in today's day and age, the, the way we think about hoarding. You know, um, my, my grandmother uh, was a little bit of a hoarder herself and would keep things around because she thought someone would wear it or someone would use it. Um, and in today's day and age, in some ways, we have a little less of that, right? In some ways, we have digital items, and so we have less physical hoarding. But the same thing happens, right? We get a gift for the holidays. It's not perfect for us, but we keep it around. We end up putting it in the closet. It goes to the back of the closet. Things go in front of it. And we end up not seeing it anymore. And soon we get something similar. We have something else that takes its place. And so I think there's two types of hoarding that are interesting in today's day and age. First, the physical hoarding, but also the digital hoarding we have, right? Think about how many photos we have or files we might have stored on Dropbox. We're worried we're going to need them someday, so we keep them around. And so the storage we need to have gets larger and larger, even though it's not physical storage. And, and so I'll throw in one for myself. I mean, thinking about all the photos that I have collected of my kids, of them playing soccer or different events they've been in, and I have multiples of each one of them. <laughs> and, I could, and I could probably go through my phone and eliminate probably at least half of the photos that I have on there. But I don't do it. And maybe for me, part of that is an element of time and actually taking yes. the time to do that. But but notice the more things we have, whether they are physical things or digital things, the more time it takes to call those things. And so the more daunting the task becomes, right? If, if every time or every week or every month we went through our photos and you know got rid of the ones where we took a picture of our pocket or we took two of the kids <laughs> at the soccer game that are identical, if we called those photos, the task wouldn't be so difficult because then every month we'd only have a month to deal with. But if it goes month on month on month, just like we have that attic room in our house or apartment where we store things that we don't need, eventually it becomes harder and harder to find things and harder and harder to call it. And so we end up having more and more stuff. So how much is the recognition of having these things a challenge or maybe people don't have enough of a recognition that they're actually doing some of these things? You know, I think it's important uh, in some cases, right? And, and not everyone has this problem all the time. Some of uh, the listeners here are probably saying, what do you mean? I get a bottle of wine, I drink it right away. Or, um, you know, I get a new shirt, I wear it at the first possible occasion. I think we have to be careful, though, once things that were not originally special start becoming uh, uh, overly special, if you will. Um, and it becomes useful to think about strategies to mitigate that, right? Be saving, hey, I'm going to wear this for New Year's, or uh, I'm going to wear this for my birthday, or I'm going to drink this bottle of wine the next time we go out to dinner. Setting a specific occasion where you decide that usage is appropriate helps us use these things and, and move on. And, and the same thing can be true in our digital world as, as well. In the end, do you think there are reasons why people end up having these attachments and maybe don't even realize it? You know, emotional attachment isn't always bad, right? It, it's nice to uh, have cherished photos uh, of our family members or, you know, things that our kids made that we keep around the house, even, even though they don't necessarily need them. It's, it's nice to have those emotional attachments. I think the challenge is when you have so many of those things that they get in the way of, of our well-being, uh, our ability to find the things we do want, um, our ability to sort of overconsume and buy things we don't need. And so in those situations, it's important to figure out ways to mitigate it and to increase our happiness as a result. So then if we have this as a component of our digital lives right now, how much then do you think this potentially continues on and enhances as we move down the road? Because- we are more and more connected to our digital selves every day, whether it be our phones, our computers. I mean, we're doing this interview on Zoom. It's just become a massive part of our lives. And certainly, right? I mean, technologies are tools um, and those tools can be very helpful. Those tools can make things easier. They can save us time. They can help us uh, work while on vacation and get something done if we need to. But they can also be detrimental, right? They can interrupt us in ways we might not want. They can uh, lead us to accumulate uh, digital files that we don't necessarily need. And so um, I think just like our offline tools, we need to manage our online tools as well. And I guess also uh, we talk a lot about the elements of how different they are from generation to generation. Certainly. I guess it's going to be very much interesting to watch how this digital component plays in with younger generations right now. Certainly. I mean, I think about this a lot when I think about a physical office, right? You know, you used to go into someone's physical office and they have shelves and shelves of physical books. 
And now many people have gotten rid of those books. Academics used to have journals. Most people don't get physical journals anymore. And so what is an office space for? Do people need as large offices? What do you put in them? Um, how do you think about how they represent yourself? There's a, a lot of interesting transitions are being made and, and certainly age plays a role, right? The, the younger you are when you've been introduced to these technologies, the less likely you may be to have physical things around and the more comfortable you may be with a, a digital only world. So this sounds like it's, it's a little bit of a, ever evolving type of research that you're doing because of all the dynamics at play. But what do you think are the takeaways, at least now from what you you, you delved into in this topic? You know, I, I think we need to think about managing our possessions, whether they are physical or, or digital. Um, I think it's, as we talked about earlier, it's important to have meaning in our lives and it's important to be emotionally attached to things in our lives. Um, that said, sometimes that can become overwhelming. Um, ordinary items can become perceived treasures, even when they're not. And we can imbue them with so much meaning that we fill our spaces with things we're never using. And so if we find ourselves in, in an overly cluttered, uh, living in an overly cluttered space, whether in our physical world or our digital world, understanding why we may have ended up there and figuring out how to manage it becomes key. Jonah, great to talk to you as always. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. You got it. Jonah Berger, marketing professor here at the Wharton School. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.